In this video, we're taking our heavily modified 80 series Land Cruiser chassis, mounting the fuel tank, rear winch cradle and cab before the floors and dash are cut out to make room for the upgraded ones. You've probably guessed it by now, but there's going to be a lot of CAD, CNC cutting, CNC folding, welding and fabrication along the way until we end up with something like this. For those of you who are new to this series, we're building a 500 rear wheel kilowatt 40 series on an 80 series chassis and there are detailed videos on the plan and build so far. Check out the link to the playlist in the description below. We left the last episode with a completed bare chassis after it had received extensive modification for suspension performance. We begin here with the CAD model of George's build. We won't be modelling everything as it takes a team of people years to get an accurate full car model. Rather just bits and pieces where it makes sense. From the last episode you can see the newly formed chassis rails in black and the old ones highlighted in blue. We're starting on the back end of the chassis with the recovery points and rear mounted winch. The cradle is nicely triangulated and designed to take a low mount style of winch. The winch mount will be made from sturdy 5mm steel which we're cutting out on the plasma table now. A nice clean cut in the end, Connor is now marking the fold lines before he takes it to the V block press where the part will turn 3D. Oh, bang on 90 mate. Right, every time. Now Connor can give the same treatment to the lower section of the winch cradle. Oh mate, look at that. Pretty good. Really good. Looks just like the cat. Time to weld it onto the car. Oh, we just put on this um, rear winch cradle. You happy about it? Yeah, it looks good. What do you reckon? Yeah, I reckon it looks good, man. Just... Put some fuel tank mounts in now. Alrighty, time to mount the fuel tank. This is a 150 litre fuel tank mounted via the cradle and strap method. We've opted to do this as the load is distributed over more surface area than the alternative of solid mounting, which is generally more susceptible to failure due to fatigue or even impact. Most OEM cars and trucks use this method and for good reason. The tank manufacturer was outsourced and it's made from 3mm aluminium with internal baffles to make sure there's always fuel at the pickup. Due to the triangulated fall link on this build, there is no other option than to mount it at the rear of the chassis. The first step to all this is to flat pattern the cat of the cradle, export it to DXF and cut it out of 3mm steel on the plasma table. After that's all done, Connor can begin folding it. <laughs> Now comes the somewhat tedious part of setting the front and the rear cradle up for welding. Everything needs to be square and millimetre perfect so the tank can be mounted correctly. We're just doing the straps for the fuel tanks and then we'll get the uh, lower ones on and hopefully test fit the tank and should be all snug. Safety first mate. Tank strap rubber is being used between the cradle and the tank. Here you can see Connor installing it so we can mock up the bottom straps properly. Then the fuel tank can go in which was made easier with a few extra hands. We're using a high tech ratchet strap to hold it in place for the time being. Looks good. Let's make the stainless straps now. We're using stainless for the fuel tank strap material as it behaves well under tension and cyclic loading. And of course we don't want it to rust. These straps were cut from 1.2mm thick stainless on the plasma table. Doing our loops in the end of our tank strap. And what sort of bending tool do you call this? This is a flathead pry bar. <laughs> As you can see, it's a well oiled machine. So we're just doing this is step one. Nice man. Step two is in the vise. And grab our soft king chrome hammer because we're going to damage our stain oh. Put a bolt through it, that's right. As you would. Make it nice and square and just wind the vice up. Not a king chrome vice, but could be. <laughs> could be. Now that's nice and tight and nice and square, so all you do 
You just give the end a little tap, tap, tap her. And then that bolt becomes nice and loose. Ready to, ready to be uh, welded together. Do you reckon that's Connor's top tip for the day? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Now that one end of the strap is complete, Connor can go about folding it to the shape of the tank. We're just setting the folder to our correct thickness for our material that we're folding. That's all the bends complete, now the threaded end can be test fitted and welded on. Yeah, Connor is now drilling some holes so it can be plug welded from the other side. The threaded end is now fully welded. Time to put the fuel tank strap rubber on. Oof, look at all that fixing surface area. That tank isn't going anywhere. Shout out to the boys down at King Chrome for me, hammer. I don't want to do it. You do it. Right, I have fuel tank installed. Not going anywhere. It's really solid, hey. If you're building a modified 40 series, LCS offers a number of aftermarket fuel tank solutions with associated mounting hardware. So make sure you check out www.lcs4x4.com.au. The rear end is starting to look like the CAD now. One last thing to complete, which is those integrated rear recovery points. Yo, what are you doing? Just trying to pay my bill. These recovery points are made out of 16 mil steel, which came off a laser cutter, and George is just cleaning them up here. Connor welds the recovery point into the chassis rail, and then the capping plate is cut out on the plasma table before it's also welded in. Recovery point and capping plate are completed which finishes off the rear end for now. This shot of the rear winch mount, fuel tank and recovery points looks just like the cab which is excellent news. Alrighty, onwards and upwards, the cab needs to be mounted to the chassis to make this build start looking like a 40 series. The already extended lower half of the cab comes down from storage and on initial inspection it looks pretty good. Not too much rust at all. Uh, look, it suits you, George. This cab was bought as an unfinished project. It was already extended by 150 mil behind the B pillar. It also had some rust repair done. Most of the holes had already been filled in in the firewall. It was in extremely good condition overall and we'd stumbled across the jackpot. To mount the cab, we're using the McKinnon's Cruiser's front body mounts. They're a tried and tested design, nice, simple, and easy to paint. Connor is now lining up the mounts before they get tacked up.
The kit comes with rear body mounts as well, but due to the custom nature of the chassis, we're making our own to suit, which is what's been cut out on the plasma table now. Carpentry tools, mate, number one. One of the advantages of using the chassis table for this build is we can quickly get accurate measurements like this one to make sure the cab is sitting level before we weld off the rear mounts. Come on, the camera there. I got it. The rear packers can be removed now which reveals the cab sitting on its new mounts, meaning we can finally start piecing the front end together. Rest the front, wrap it back. Alrighty. Once everything was loosely in place, we used packers to put it in a position we were happy with before cutting out a front bib mount on the plasma table. players after 15 years every day. <laughs> that weld mask. In addition to the front bib mount, we made up some panel joiners between the Valance panel and the cab to ensure everything stayed square whilst we worked on it. The intention is to remove these later when the tube guards are all set up and we can mount off them. Time to put the windscreen on. Before putting the hinges on though, Paddy is running a tap through the 50 year old threads to make it easier for us in the long run. Seems like a good time to install the bonnet strut kit while there's nothing in the engine bay. This is something we've developed in-house and comes with all the hardware you see here and a comprehensive set of fitting instructions. These are available at lcs4x4.com.au The bonnet strut kit looks good and so does the cab on top of the chassis. 
Time to install the new dash, floor pans and transmission tunnel. We'll look at the design later on, but first it's time to remove all the old parts. We're removing the dash. We're going to cut there, just through the first, that's double skin through there, so just cut through the weld. So drill out the spot welds, get the chisel on it, crack them all open, give it a wiggle and a tap, and the whole thing will just pop off. Ready to go, got to clean up a couple of welds, uh, coat it all in some weld through spray and we're good to go. The old dash was no match for Connor and his grinder, now he can begin cross bracing the cab before cutting the old floors out. Ready to go. Yeah. Cut the floor out. Nice and solid. Yeah, mate. She's not going anywhere. <laughs> That's all we needed. Ancient floor pans put up a fight, but they came out in the end, and now you're looking at a cab without a dash or a floor, and you may be wondering why. Well, it's for good reason. All sorts of gearbox and engine combinations are getting put into modified 40 series nowadays, and generally, the standard floor and transmission tunnel configuration won't work. We've developed a kit which replaces the floor with completely flat floors and doesn't have the old stamps for the fuel tank and other bits. This now makes it easier for a bigger transmission tunnel to go in which runs the length of the cab. We designed this kit using 3D scan data of an FJ cab and my CAD naming convention tells me we are up to the AE revision or 5th iteration and we are confident that it will more or less fit anything now. The floor is cut from 1.6mm steel and then ribs are bead rolled into it to add stiffness and also make it look sick. We've used the laser to etch the marks for the ribs accurately, as you can see here. Once both sides are complete, Connor can put the returns in them to add strength. These were intentionally left until after the bead rolling so they didn't interfere with the bead rolling machine. We're going to put some floor pans in the tunnel kit in to George's car. No, we're not fully welding them, we're just going to tech screw them in until we get the engine and all the gearbox and all that sort of stuff perfected and then we can blaze everything off at once, once we're confident with the fit but we're pretty confident it's going to work. Connor had removed paint and added weld through primer to the surfaces that the floor pans would be plug welded to, which will happen in a future video. 
When the old floor pans were cut out, there was a lip which remained around the edge of the cab. You can see there are plug welding holes which the laser cutter cut out around the edges of the floor pan which will align with the lip. Connor is using screws to temporarily hold everything in place. The new floors look good. It's worth noting this is a custom set to account for the extra cab. Time to fold up the transmission tunnel now and we're at the local laser cutters to utilize their CNC press brake. This is the completed transmission tunnel. The new design gives plenty of rearward clearance to any powertrain combo and makes jobs like gearbox and transfer case removal very easy. It's made from 1.2mm steel and features a removable lid with a 3mm rubber gasket which was water jet cut to keep the cab nice and dry. <laughs> The floors will get braced later once we've confirmed the engine and transmission position, but for now, they're looking pretty good. With all the computers and screens we're using for this build, we've opted for a more race car inspired dash layout. This dash was designed using 3D scan data and features three removable panels which make for easy access to the computers and wiring which will eventually be mounted behind. This dash is narrower than the standard one to accommodate for the roll cage windscreen pillars. The panels will get cutouts in them for all the screens and switches, but for now we're just leaving them blank. The dash comes off the CNC press brake with this hem, which hooks over the exposed sheet metal in the cab. We're putting George's dash in, we're going to uh, get it all set up nice and straight, clamp a nice straight edge to it and uh, weld it off. <laughs> Like the floor pans, the dash has plenty of laser cut holes in it for plug welding, which is what Connor's doing now. Chucking in some M6 nut sets into our like just straight in there like that. <laughs> We're gonna nut set our M6 nut sets into the dash, so then we can insert our um, fascia panels on there. Connor is giving the nutsert gun a real workout, and after 29 nut certs, we're able to resume real-time playback again. Look at that. You wouldn't read about it. Teamwork makes dream work, mate. Oh, looks good. That's the dash fully installed. We'll revisit this in the future to mount everything to it. Connor did a ripper job on the install and all the welds look extremely smooth. Let's look at some shots of the floor pan and the dash together now. They've really brought the build into the 21st century and it will make it much easier to shoehorn a modern powertrain in. 
These products are both available at lcs4x4.com.au and yes, will ship internationally. That's it for this episode. We've come a long way from a bare chassis. Stay tuned though, because next up, we've changed direction with the transmission on this build and we have to make a bell housing adapter to make it all work. And we're also going to get stuck into the bar work.